just the way things have gone today. Uh, and you'll hear about this as we go. Today I want to talk to you about symbols of friendship. The forever friendship with God. We're borrowing Dwight Nelson's title. May loves it. I love it. I'm sure you do. It's what we've always believed, but it's saying in a fresh and meaningful new way. I'm not going to talk about the 27 fundamentals of the church today. I'm not going to talk about the doctrines of the remnant church. I'm not going to talk about being baptised into the doctrines or into the church. Now, all of that is true. Don't take me wrong. But we're going to say something altogether different. It's what I've been saying for three years. We need to know what our God is like. And that's what it's about today. Symbols of friendship. And I've put on the front of uh, the little paper I'm giving to some of the family and to Bill the symbol of baptism. It's only a symbol. If water doesn't wash away your sin, Bill. You'll find that out by tonight before sunset. What does it do? What's it a symbol of? All right, we're going to talk about that today. But symbols. Well, about a month ago, I was the happy... No, we were the happiest couple in the world. Because when we went home from the service, sitting in our mailbox was a big square packet we'd waited for a long time for, and it was supposed to be picked up at the post office, but they took the ticket off and put it in the box, which is a criminal law, because it was the title deeds to our house and our land. Yeah. But I looked at the title deeds and it says, you only own the top four inches, the crown owns what's under that. And I thought, well, that's a scandal because a lot of the piece of land that I'm supposed to own is not land, it's sandstone. And the house is built straight on it. The bricks are glued straight to the stones. But anyway, it's a symbol. That paper is a symbol that we own a house and land. Praise God. And praise God for the tithe pays who paid our wages that we saved money and did it. Now, another symbol, something that's more realistic. Are you listening to us kids now? May you didn't know anything about this. Come out here. Please, please, May, you didn't know anything about this. Now, I'm doing this because she made a vow that she had never ever paid the wedding ring on. So I thought, well, I better not ask her to take it off. I asked her, she said, yes, I would. Then I thought, no, well, I won't. But that's a wedding ring. What's that a symbol of? Come on, young people. What's a wedding ring a symbol of? It's a symbol of what, Cloris? Yes, and a contract between two people, right? <coughs> now, how she's lived under the same roof with me for 40 years yesterday, it was the day, I don't know, but anyway. The Lord's given her grace and strength and faith and hope. You know what she said to me yesterday? It really blew me. She said, um, I hope we make the next 10. And it really hurt me. She doesn't know what it did to me, and she didn't mean But I thought, that's ridiculous. That's not a statement of faith. That's a statement of question. She said, no, it's a statement of faith. I said, well, it wasn't to me. I hope we make the next 10. And she said, because many don't. But I know what she meant. But the way I heard it first, it shook me. Right. But that little ring is a symbol of a contract between two people. Baptism is a symbol of a contract today between Bill and his God. Right, that's what we're going to talk about today, something different. Now, God is his Heavenly Father, he's our Heavenly Father, and by the way, uh, we belong to a big family when we belong to the Heavenly Father, uh, bigger than the Lynch and the Rick Rose clan combined. They're all here today in force. I wish you were here every week, it's lovely. Just reminds me of Kula Cup where we married. You know, they came out of the devices, they came out of the trees, they came out of the sand, they came from anywhere. Relatives. Everywhere. This is wonderful because it's a happy day. Now, when we talk about Heavenly Father, we can think of Him as Father in two ways. I've thought a lot about this lately, and then in my lesson back, I noticed it clarified what I was thinking about. We say God is Father of everybody. He sends the rain on the just and the unjust. That is true. But there are some people he can't love as he wants to love. He's their paternal Father. He set them in motion. He gave them life. 
He put them in the womb and he set them on sale on the seas of life. He is their paternal father. He's responsible for every man's existence, whether the man loves him or not. But he's only father to those who respond to his love. Right? And that's the difference between Christians who know him as father and Christians who name him as God, but don't really know him. Now there could be some of us here today and he's just a paternal relationship. I want to challenge you today, he must be father. Paternal means just your physical existence is responsible for that. But fatherhood means there's an intimate, loving relationship. And God, he's paternal father of all men, but fatherhood belongs to all the people who are the children of God, who accept his gracious offer of salvation and his gracious offer of intimate relationship, friendship forever, Bill. That's what it's about. And I want to tell you that Bill's here today because of all his parents taught him, all the churches taught him over the years, but finally what Dwight really sprung on him in a new way that he needs a forever friendship with God. Thank you, Dwight. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And that's why Bill's here today for this baptism. It's a culmination of many events. All right. God's Spirit, God's drawing power is a force, and yet it's not just a force. Now, there are two great demonstrations of God's love for us during the history of mankind. We've read one in the Scripture reading. I'm reading from the New Living Bible. You'll notice it said here, uh, Moses was talking to the children of Israel, to God's family. He was talking to the people who believed in and believed they had the fatherhood of God. But some of them were beginning to stray, some of them were murmuring, some were going after God's. And Moses here is challenging them to have a forever friendship with the true God. That's what it's all about. And you, you heard Jim Regal. But I want to read, first of all, to you, verse 32. Just pluck a little bit out of the middle. He said, look, you people, you family of God, you people who believe in the fatherhood of God, some of you who are a bit shaky, search all of history. This is beautiful, Andy. From the time God created us and put us on earth until now, search from one end of heaven to the other. See if anything as great as this has ever happened before. Has any nation ever heard the voice of God speaking from afar? Mount Sinai, known as Horeb in this chapter, as you did and survived. Has any other God taken a nation from him, for himself by rescuing it from a pagan nation by means of, and he didn't say happiness. First word he said, trials. Then he said, miracles and signs, wonders, war. Awesome power, terrifying acts. Yet, that is what the Lord your God did for you in Egypt right before your very eyes. Think of your own life. God, through trials and miracles and wonders, has delivered you today to this sanctuary because of his love. The Old Testament knows a loving, caring God. He said in verse 37, Moses gives the reason, he says, because he loved your ancestors. If you listen to many theologians today and many Christians, they say the God of the Old Testament was a tyrant. He was taking out his vengeance, even on his own people. Not so. Not so. He wasn't a monster. He wasn't unforgiving. Moses had it right. He said, he loved your ancestors and he loves you. Isn't that beautiful? And he wants a forever friendship with you. Well, that was 1410 BC. Moses talking about what happened at Sinai and how God had delivered his people from Egypt because he was a loving God. The first demonstration of God on earth interceding personally for his people. Alright. 
Go over to 1 Chronicles 16. Well, I want to look at a few words here that David, King David mentioned to people when he was uh, dedicating his temple and shifting the ark to Jerusalem and rededicating things. And uh, he had a lot of things here to say about God and reminding the people and about the fatherhood of God. Verse, uh, chapter 16, 1 Chronicles, verse 7. And that day David gave to Asaph and his fellow Levites this song of thanksgiving to the Lord. Now I want you to read through it with me. Not all of it, but some of the verses. Give thanks to the Lord, that's Jehovah God, and proclaim his greatness. Let the whole world know what he has done. And Bill, that's what baptism's about. It's not just to tell the church and the world that you believe the seventh day is the Sabbath. It's not just to tell the world that you believe this church believes that Ellen White saved us from theological disaster. It's not just to tell the world that you believe you ought to give God his tithe. It's to proclaim the love of God and to tell the world and all your relatives you know today, forever, God is your mate. That's what it's all about. And if you look down here a little further, it says, uh, sing to him. Well, I'm glad you've been singing today. And thank you, the musicians, for your wonderful music. Yes, sing his praises. <coughs> Tell everyone about his miracles. Tell everyone. I was in that story before tonight. I sat in a little plane, she said, squeezed up with a Cook Island lady. She's about three parts German. And she was sobbing the heart out because her husband died. And the spirit kept saying to me, Tell her. Tell her the good news. Tell her the good news, she'll see him, she's got faith. I couldn't tell him. We got out over the reef, and then I tapped her on the shoulder, and I, I was reading in Revelation, right there, 21, reading it. And all my trousers were getting wet with the tears, and so I ended up and I told her. And she squeezed around in the seat, just a little skinny thing she was, and she looked me in the eye, and she challenged me, and she reprimanded me, and she said, George, you Adventists should be telling everybody. That's what he's saying here. That's what David's saying. <coughs> Exalt his holy name. Worshippers of the Lord rejoice. Search for the Lord for his strength. Keep on searching. Yes. Good wisdom and counsel for the new year. Think of the wonderful works he's done. The miracles and the judgments he's handed down. He is the Lord our God. His rule is seen throughout all the land. Now, Bill, he always stands by his covenant the commitment he made for a thousand generations. A forever friendship. That's what he wants. And that's the God of the Old Testament, but it's the God of the New Testament always. Let's remember, we all wear a wedding ring on our heart and on our mind that we are married to Jesus Christ. An agreement of friendship forever. And that's what baptism's all about. And that's what this day's all about. In verse 16, he said, this is the covenant you made with Abraham. And to everybody ever since. Verse 23, he said, let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Each day proclaim the good news that he saves. Publish his glorious deeds among the nations. Tell everyone about the amazing things that he does. But be very careful and make sure you don't tang get tangled up with the things that are almost identical to what he does and can do, but it's the devil. And it's happening. And it's happening in our church. Be careful. Satan's getting us ready, Bill, for when he puts his foot on this ground and says he's Jesus returned. And he preaches the Sermon on the Mount again. And he preaches a lot of the sermons that he preached when he was on earth. And then he asks the disciples to verify that he changed the Sabbath. And so Satan's doing some things now that look just like this. And he's trapping some of us. Be careful. Don't be deceived, Jesus. All right. David was reminding the people, the family of God, about the, about God. He said in verse 25, Great is the Lord, He's worthy to be praised. The gods of the nations are merely idols. But the Lord is the Creator. Isn't that something? So you may having a friendship publicly today, making and signing your agreement with the Creator, Bill. 
honor and majesty surround, strength and beauty are in his dwelling. All nations of the world recognize Jehovah. Recognize Jehovah, he is glorious and strong. Give the Lord the glory he deserves. That's what baptism's about. It's you giving God the glory for what he's done for you. <laughs> Thought about that before? That's what it is. Verse 31, he said, Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Tell the nations that the Lord is king. Let the trees of the forest rustle with the praise before the Lord, for he's coming to judge the earth. Ah, there's the crunch. There's the crunch. Because he's coming back to them. And that's why Bill has made his stand today to sign in public his agreement for an everlasting relationship with a loving fatherhood to be a recipient and respond to the paternity and to respond and inherit fatherhood because he's coming back and he wants to meet him on the right foot. Not bad thinking, is it? That's what it's all about. And that's what it means to you and I who have already been baptised. What about you young people and youth who have not been baptised? It's about a relationship, a friendship falling in love with Jesus Christ. Give thanks to the Lord, said David. He is good. And David ought to have known. David ought to have known. He did a lot for David. His faithful love endures forever. And then he challenges the family of God. He said, cry out, save us, O God, of our salvation. Gather and rescue us from among the nations so we can thank your holy name and rejoice and praise. I just finished reading these verses and I went to listen to the news on New Year's Day and they spent 10 minutes telling us what happened in New Zealand. And in the morning in the BBC they spent 10 minutes telling us what happened in the world in 1998. And not one of them was good or happy or nice or lovely. Everything was murder and war and hate was ghastly. And so I said, God, David's right. Let's cry out, gather and rescue us from amongst this mess. And that's why Bill's come here today, and I trust that's why you've come to support him. And I want to challenge you young people today, whether you're married or single, or you're only nine years of age, it's time you accepted Christ's offer, because soon It'll be too late. We need to get out of this place and we need to be in a right relationship for him to take us because he's only going to take those who have responded and accepted his fatherhood. If we've spurned him, he will say, I'm sorry, I, I don't know you. Well, there was a second time We've talked all about it the last few weeks, so we won't go into it in time. There was a second time when God came down personally and demonstrated his love and that he meant business about this forever friendship with humankind if they'd respond to his fatherhood. When was that? When he came down into Bethlehem with the angels and he said, what? I've delivered my love to you. He's down there in the manger. Go and talk. He's arrived. I'm here again. I mean what I say. I want a forever friendship with you and I've sent the wherewith all for it. I've sent him who will make it possible forever so that the agreement will always be contractually safe and genuine. And you know what it was wrapped in? Not happiness. Not happiness. Not happiness. Wasn't very long after it and Herod brought in the unhappiness. He sloshed the head off every kid who was over two. Every man. And I thought to myself the other day, why did you allow it, God? I was driving to Dargaville and I thought about it and I reasoned why God allowed it. Because out of it, he brought a great truth. There was no other kid born on time or alive who could claim to be the Messiah. Think of that. 
The land was full of false Christ and full pro false prophets, but none of them could match the calendar date of Daniel and say, I'm the one. Isn't that phenomenal? Out of the, the horrible things of heaven, God brought glory and safety to the Messiah. No other young man of 30 years of age could claim to be the Messiah. Because the word in shown his love in nature and scripture and saintly people but the only definitive way he has shown to all of us as humans something that we can believe without any doubt is the revelation of himself in his son the unique God and saviour Jesus Christ we have a far greater privilege Bill this is not to offend anyone because we know it's true never break it. It's wonderful to see all the family here today. We've never had such a Christmas and New Year in all our life. The kids are ringing us all the time because we're not there and about, you know, great, just still living together and all this kind of stuff. Wonderful talk. And what's all going on? Too sad that some of them got the flu and couldn't go away for their holiday. And it's good. I'm not knocking family relationships. But listen, there is a far greater privilege for me and I and for you than the love of relatives. It's the privilege of the love of God and being a member of his immediate family because we're all in that. That's all of us. True? And today, Bill is going to be officially signed in as a member of the house of God, the family of God, the Fongaray Adventist branch of the remnant people who believe the truth of scripture. Baptism's only a symbol, but it's a symbol of joining the family. There's an interesting story about a man who wasn't even a Jew, who understood the prophecies of the Old Testament, what I've just said to you about what Moses said and what David said to his people, and he saw it. He saw it not just as a set of doctrines, it was doctrine, but he saw God's love in person on Sinai. He saw God's love in person in the Old Testament prophecies. And he heard the news in Jerusalem and he put the Old Testament together with the good news and he knew the truth. And he knew the truth was the Creator God wants a personal, loving relationship with me. This ink black treasurer from Ethiopia. Go to Acts chapter 8. It's a fabulous story. Acts chapter 8. And God came down again in the form of the Holy Spirit and said to Philip, Now look, there's a guy down here. He wants to respond to my fatherhood. He wants to uh, respond to my offer for a forever friendship with him. So uh, go over and tell him the 27 fundamentals of the Jewish faith. And if he believes them, you can baptize him. That's important. You have to know them. You have to believe them. But that wasn't the issue. The first issue is, does he love me? That's the first issue, and everything else follows on. All right. Let's look down here in, uh, in verse 26. As, Phil, as for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, Go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to, to Gaza. When I was down in Gaza, I remember this story, and I felt I was on a holy ground. So he did, and he met the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under the queen of Ethiopia. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and he was now returned. Seated in his carriage, he was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. And Philip goes over to this very dignified, very 
authority, very special man in the world, driving, if you wish, in his black Mercedes from Ethiopia, or to it back to Ethiopia from Jerusalem, and this evangelist, man of God, has to hide the slide up against his slow-moving Mercedes because he's reading and says, Do you know what you're reading about, mate? And he didn't wind the window up and say, I don't talk to all sorts on the road. I don't pick up hitchhikers. He said, get in here. I need you. Can you tell me what this is all about? He said, this guy Isaiah, is he talking about himself or is he talking about somebody else? Is he talking about Jesus Christ, the Messiah of the Jews, who has already been and gone? Could it be that? Explain it to me. You remember Philip said, well, that's all right. Uh, and he said, well, how can I know about it unless someone tells me? And so they went on a bit further. And let's, let's see what it says in verse 35. It's significant. Uh, chapter 8 and uh, verse 35. So Philip began with the same scripture and used many others. So he started in Isaiah 53, talking about the Messiah coming to die for us, and uh, told him the good news. As they rode along, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, hey, look! There's some water. Why can't I be baptized? So he ordered the carriage to stop and they went down into the water and Philip was baptized. And I'll tell you why, Bill and everybody, because he didn't know everything about the Jewish religion, but he believed, believed that Jesus Christ was his God and his Saviour and he wanted a love relationship with him. And I hope that's what you hear for. Isn't that beautiful? I'll tell you what, I reckon he read the rest of his Bible on the west of the way home. It was a long way. And the Holy Spirit, who had come and sent Philip to him, no doubt would have told him what it was all about, and it would have all started to fit into place. And Ethiopia has been, a, has been and was better, a great centre of Christianity through the ages. So baptism is a symbol of a forever, forever friendship with the Messiah with God. Boys and girls. Children. Think about baptism. It's a symbol to your parents and to the world and to God that you're loving. That's a growth experience. It's the door into the family of God. And just for the information of parents, and the figures haven't changed much in 40 years, the Seventh-day Adventist children are baptised at nine. 80% of them in the world stay with the church, with Jesus Christ and the church. 80%. And every year up to 17 that it's put off, the percentage comes down to around about 45 and 17 is a serious date because the facts and the figures, now fact, figures do lie and liars do figure, but we ought to believe what they tell us something, that if you haven't been baptised by, by the time you're 17, there's a very sad chance you never, ever will be. It's a miracle that you are. Bill, you're a miracle. No, that's no joke, and it's serious stuff. Because after we're 17, the mind is definitely set of where it's going. Serious stuff, isn't it, parents? Are you telling your children? I'm studying with some children now, nine up. And I want to tell you, man, they're hungry, they're true. Yeah, they've got the ways of children, but they understand. They want a relationship with God. When they're baptised, I don't care and don't know. But I know in my own family, say with our children we didn't push them we didn't ask them do they want it to be because they live with it every day and they were baptized here if you want to make a problem you say 12 jesus went to the temple of cross because god the father knew he had to get him there then get him to see it then or it'll be too late bill we need you